Hello everybody, really nice to see you. Hope that everybody enjoyed it, the crowdy space. If anyone is uh, still outside, let him go in. And yeah, we're gonna start uh, as, as normal, as usual, fast and uh, ask some questions, ask whatever you wanna ask. Life, bodybuilding, coaching. There is no stupid question. So let's try to keep that in the, in the, in the head. And uh, yeah, let's go. Anyone, any questions to Wesley Stefan? <laughs> it is done. It's like it's like when he is judging. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Anyone have any questions, guys? Yeah, prep is going actually uh, very well. So right now we're uh, pretty much exactly seven weeks out. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so far, uh, body weight has been dropping, but if I look at my conditioning at the moment, compared to the body weight, like if I compare it even to the R Classic, the body weight seems to be higher with the same conditioning, which means probably will be closer to the weight limit, I think, compared to the Arnold, or will simply be even more shredded than before so uh yeah the, the weight is just a thing you gotta hit to get below the weight limit but it's all about getting the best look that's what we uh, are going for and um yeah we achieved the best look so far at the arnold but once you achieve a certain look you can always go one step beyond so that's what we're uh, aiming for this time because this is the show of course to show your best the olympia and I'm uh, yeah, very happy to be doing this with uh, Stefan and also to be here in front of you guys. So thank you very much for uh, coming. Um, maybe a funny fact, well, two funny facts. I've been here before, not in Oslo, but actually in Norway before uh, with, as a holiday with, uh, with the family, before I was a bodybuilder. And I remember it as one of the most fun holidays I've had before because it felt like this kind of feels like a country where I could live as well. I'm from the Netherlands, it's a small country, so I'm used to cold, rain, stuff like that, but here it just feels more like fresh, especially when you're in the mountains and the nature. But then years later, I found out that I'm actually 54% Norwegian. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I'm less Dutch than Norwegian. So, uh, yeah, to be exact, Nordic, I'm 54%, and like Dutch, German, is like 30% and the other percent is like the, from the UK, but most of me is actually from here. So uh, yeah, it's special for me to be here. And once again, uh, thank you guys for coming. And don't forget, like this is your chance now to ask any questions you want. Um, we can of course talk however long we want because uh, that's what we're good at. But like now this is your opportunity because maybe it's gonna take a long time before this happens again. So now is your opportunity to ask anything, even if you think oh, everybody uh, it, it won't be interested in this question, trust me, there are no stupid questions or dumb questions, just ask whatever you, whatever you have in your mind, because now is your chance, and uh, yeah, so uh, go for it. I just want to shortly catch up to the question uh, before, how is prep going? Um, prep goes good, and for me as a coach it's always very interesting because it's different every, at any time. Um, the I think the prototype of the um, Arnold prep was actually the Olympia prep before, where we settled everything to 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 get in line. Um, the Arnold prep then just was um, the main obstacle to to keep Wesley fresh and keep him on the same or a little bit better condition as at the Arnold. And the way the Arnold turned out was um, incredible, but, but for me also something I, I, I thought what could happen. Because when it comes to bodybuilding, and, and we have a judge here, one of my favorite judges actually, because we <laughs> no, not only because he's sitting there, because you can ask uh, him always for honest feedback, and that's something uh, which is very important in that sport. But in bodybuilding, you also need to get um, oh fuck, what's what's in what's in English? Ah, you need to get the possibility 
to get in that first call out. So when it went to the Olympia, um, Wesley always was in the roster of the first call out because they mostly do eight or ten people call outs, but they never gave him the chance uh, to stand in the Chris to Urs range. They never put him next to it um, because I don't know why, but at that point they never gave him the chance. There was always the Wesley has two slim legs, for example, which always had been bullshit. The Arnold showed that, but they never gave him the chance. When it comes to the Arnolds and there is a smaller athlete roster, it was clear that he will be compared to that top five spot. And actually then they saw the first time, oh fuck, he's actually quite good. Oh fuck, he's actually better than them. And he, he deserves to be the winner. So I think sometimes in bodybuilding, it's not only how good you are, it's also which chance do you get to succeed? With whom are you compared to be in the possibility to get your win? And I think from that perspective, uh, the, the Arnold turned out really, really good. But when I, I I'm a, an absolute nerd when it comes to bodybuilding. Not even when I get check-ins. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I wake up and go through pictures and go through pictures again and sending the people the pictures and marking little things in the pictures. And when I compare, the look at the Olympia to the Arnold was quite the same. There wasn't that big difference. He just got the chance to display it. And with the chance to display it, his immediately his mindset and his appearance on stage changed. So he got much more dominant. There was much more self-confident. And that lead to that incredible good package uh, Wesley displayed. And I'm definitely sure that we're going to carry that to the Olympia stage. Uh, main goal physics-wise was to get... Um, especially, but that are mostly posing tweaks, uh, getting that lower back a little bit shorter, getting a little bit more density in the glutes, uh, getting the lat sweep out a little bit better, um, to display that, to um, get absolutely the, the, the chance uh, to that top spot. What do you say about opportunities and chances on stage? Um, yeah, I think it's something in it um, that the overview of your presentation, the overview of your look, and the overview of those small details that you didn't bring last time really, really matter. So it depends about good coach and the person who is competing and listen and follow the all the things that that is saying from his coach and I think if you follow the the honest and good feedback and then you're gonna follow what your coach is saying I think you will get your chance but you need to bring like everything best you can for sure, but especially when I, I go a little bit deeper now. <laughs> especially when it comes to the to the classic physique. Last year there weren't that many people, but I think it was two or three years ago when there were 60 people on stage. And I think pre-judging was lasting two, nearly two hours. And actually, when as a bodybuilding fan like me or as a judge, you are sitting in, 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 in the crowd, um, you saw third call out, you saw, saw fourth call out. And I think in every call out, I had one or two persons I was thinking, why isn't that one in the first call out? And actually, most of the time afterwards, there are no chances for them to get into that call outs again because, you know, I think you can, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, the quarter turns in the beginning determine the call outs. And actually, if the headshot s says after the quarter turns, okay, that guy is first, that guy is second call out, third call out, fourth call out, whatever, that is made in concrete. Yeah. And nothing changes anymore. So, but the people still haven't done all their poses. And they could move up, 
they could get harder, they could move up, but they aren't. So um, is it like that? Mm, not every time. Things can change. Mm, quarter tones is just first is just first look. So the old job is going when when you see those guys doing all of the poses, and then magic happen. Yeah, even if it's let's say fifteen minutes later, you say it was two hours. So in two hours everything can change. So let's say you've been on the stage in your quarter turns, you look like this, but in two hours you're doing back double biceps, and then judges say, okay, this guy, yeah, he, he have it today, he bring it today, yeah. Same in other posing, in other in other poses, you know. So I think the magic happened when you have the comparisons and the quarter turns is just first look on how the things is yeah, looking. But the, but, the pro but, the, but the problem actually is when it's like you said, then you had been in the third callout with the back double biceps because before just the quarter turns have been and the callouts were set and the people don't get the chance anymore to stand with the best one even if they improved so much during the time. So that what what I was meant uh, when it comes to you also need to get the chances to be in that top spot um, because sometimes, you know, it's just been said about the quarter turns um, and you don't get the chance to to move up after quarter turns, after quarter turns you know, because we, we, they already know, so... That, that, that's mean maybe, that's mean maybe after quarter turns you're not ready to be in the top position. Maybe. So, for all competitors out there, uh, <laughs> never underestimate the importance of the quarter turns. Because <laughs> me as a coach especially say that when I get check-ins from the people, most of the, uh, of the time the people don't have the quarter turns. Um, but that's actually the first impression and the symmetry round which will determine um, if you are in the first call out or not. Yep. Yeah, with the quarter turns I also remember I, um, after the Arnold victory, I reviewed some videos, live streams of what the reactions were of people when I first got on stage because it was like, okay, was it a win because I started to beat the other guys later on in the comparisons or was it right from the moment I got on stage? And the moment that I stood there, flexed the legs and stood in the front relaxed, Everybody in the live stream was like, whoa, look at Wesley. That's and that, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. That's the first look everybody gets. So not only the audience, but also the judges, everybody watching from home, that's the first look they get. And then they keep looking at you to see, okay, how do the other guys stack up to that first impression? And if you can hold that shape, yeah, then you're pretty much guaranteed a top spot for sure. Because the first impression, it lasts. And that's a cliche to say, but in bodybuilding it's true. Because yeah, the moment you're standing there next to the other guys, and like Stefan was saying, like at the Arnold, the roster was smaller. So in the first numerical callout, so that's not even the judged callout yet, you just get on stage random by random numbers at first. And it was already Urs and Ramon pretty much next to me in that very first uh, comparison on the from the whole day like the first comparison was already with pretty much the top two of last year and when you then stand out in your front relaxed immediately then you already get a very good impression from everybody and also the the, the reaction from everybody and it's going to be hard to ignore that for the rest of the comparison so uh, I, I like to give you an insight on how i felt like a force to get on stage you know you look pretty good because you're backstage and you kind of look at the others and you're like, I remember them looking better. Or is it just that I'm looking at myself and I'm looking a little sharper than usual so they don't look as dominant over me anymore? So it's like it's very small things backstage. You can already see, okay, I feel super confident. I know I will be compared to these guys and I know I look pretty good. Let's really stand up there with a smile as that helps as well, the presentation, the confidence you're showing on stage. And then you're standing there and then in the first judged call out where the judges call out your name, who's gonna be in the first official call out, 
Then they um, put me uh, and Ramon in the middle, but there was not middle, there was four guys, I think. Yeah. And yeah, and then the, fir the two middle guys, like there's no clear winner yet because there are four people, so no one can stand in the middle. But I was never moved to the outside. And if anybody is used to being moved to the outside of the first call out, it's me. Like usually, like even like even if I'm put, like if even if I stand in the middle, like by by random call out, okay, everybody uh, walks on and I stand in the middle. You just say Wesley and Brian or Wesley and Chris or Wesley and Ur switch. And then I'm like on the outside and I have to battle myself into the, but I already know if I'm on the outside here, it's probably not gonna change anymore. But this time I wasn't moved at all. Like I, I stood there and I, and I started to dawn on me, wait a second, I'm not only in the first call out, I'm actually being compared probably with the number one or two guy right now. So that was really a special feeling. And I remember uh, when I got backstage again that you you came, you came uh, to me and uh yeah you really and, and you really put that belief in me that wait a second we can really do this it's not just like the other competitions now it's really possible and that really brought a fire into me which also tells you guys how important it is to have somebody in your corner who truly cares about how you're doing and your progress and your success so uh, that was a very nice feeling to have, and then you have so much motivation to carry you through the whole day to the finals and yeah, to ultimately uh, do your very best. But that was uh, a very nice memory of me that I have, and uh, yeah, I, I'll never forget it. It was the, one of the best moments, of course, winning that show in my body on the career ever. And uh, it, it, right now, back then, I had a motivation on that day, but the victory itself, it gives you also the motivation that, well, yeah, you got to see yourself now as a different kind of competitor. Now that you beat some of the best in the whole world, who beat you, like I've never beat them before. I've been competing at the Olympics since 2018, and the moment those guys got on stage, they beat me immediately. And I never beat them again until the Arnold. So for me, it's like a very special event that happened for me, and it put belief in me that I can achieve something great here. So. That really makes the prep mentally easier too, because no matter what I have to do, I'll do it regardless, just to get in the best shape possible. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be a very exciting show for sure. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Since you uh, won the Arnold, will you automatically get in the first column in the Olympia? Or no, not automatically, because if I screw up my uh, my conditioning or I, I spill over with uh, with the loading, I mean, they're not going to... I think, it, yeah, if you're spilled, you're not showing conditioning, you're not showing exactly what they want to see, because Chris Bumstead came to me uh, backstage at the Arnold after the pre-judging, and he, sa he, he told me, now you set the standard. That is famous quote, of course, now you can never be worse than this ever again. Because if you are, you're gonna be punished for it. So that's also in bodybuilding. You always, even if you're maybe the best on that day, if you're worse than your previous self, you will still, you might still get punished for that because you're always gonna beat yourself. That's the first thing you're always gonna do. So yeah, it's not automatic that you're gonna be in the first call out, but if I show up in a very, very good shape, at least very comparable to the Arnold, then it's probably going to happen because everybody wants to see it. The kind of the storyline has been has been made for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's not like that the judges think, oh, we want this battle to happen so bad. Even if he looks horrible, we're gonna put him in the first call out. So that's not gonna happen. You gotta you gotta show your best shape ever, and then yeah, the chance is super high that you'll be in the first call out. But I always say. You never know, and whenever I do say, oh, I think I'll be battling with the top guys, don't think I underestimate the rest, because there are so many good guys right now, so many new guys also coming to the Olympia, guys who switched from Open, um, who now to Classic Physique, who, like me at the beginning, when you weigh more, and you then you gotta make a weight cap, you will be super shredded, because otherwise you can't make it. Like Hosema from uh, Spain, for example, that guy, uh, yeah, I mean, his back double bicep, it's, it's, it's insane, for example. And that's because, in comparison to his open body, 
he looks way better now because he's forced to go down to a new low body weight and it only showed it made his body better in terms of conditioning so you never know what's going to happen when you're actually there but uh yeah I'm, I'm very confident that something good will happen that's for sure thank you very much Kimbros podcast är en stolt samarbetspartner med Gymgrossisten som är en av de ledande aktörerna inom för kosttillskott och träningsprodukter. Med koden Gymbros får du nå 15% rabatt på ordinär pris på hela sortimentet i både Norge och Sverige. Alltså med koden Gymbros får du nå 15% rabatt på både gymgrossisten.no och gymgrossisten.se. Yes. So I uh, appreciate you both being here. Um, so I'm really interested in like your relationship with Stefan, like how the coaching relationship works and what's like, what's the one thing, like specific thing that you can say about him that makes him a good coach for you? Yeah, so what I really love about Stefan is his always his very objective view and that he's a very nice guy, nice personality overall. Like like some coaches, they are 100% bodybuilding. They, that you can talk, to them about anything else but bodybuilding and being a client like it, it sounds like there's a hierarchy that he like the coach is above you and the client is below you but um, like I view it more as a collaboration as well um, where we can just talk about stuff outside of bodybuilding and like whenever we see each other either in uh, Vegas or at the Arnold we usually talk half of the time about other stuff as well <laughs> Uh, about the children or something and uh, th- it takes away like a little bit of that pressure the whole time on you gotta be your best you gotta do this or did you do this again like I'm not a guy who needs that like I do it anyway and in my head I have everything very clear but whenever I do have a question he can always answer it in a way that gives me full confidence that it's the right decision so it's like uh, yeah, for me it's like the ultimate like I you I coached myself before and yeah you you maybe you have the knowledge maybe you can but emotionally mentally it's impossible to judge yourself in a, in an objective way and whenever I send a shape picture to Stefan uh, he knows exactly what's going on how I look no matter how the lighting is you always know okay the hamstrings are not as dry now as before let's fix that or or now you do look good or Like it's 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 the little things that give you that confidence boost to know what the next step is, yeah. and uh, to me it's a uh, it's it's been a super nice relationship to have, and it really helped me get yeah as everybody has now realized to a much higher level than before. Yeah. I used to be way too hard on myself in terms of it's never good enough. I go way overboard with every, everything, like dieting down way too hard, and I never. On stage, I was never the guy I could be, and Stefan really brought it out of me. Of course, it always takes a little time at the beginning, but now we went from 11th to 8th to 7th, and now at the Arnold this result, so it's like a stepping stone where it, it doesn't go up and down, but it seems to go only progressively up, and uh, yeah, that's just a very special thing for me. Yeah. yeah. I actually have a follow-up question, Mark, exactly that as well. Like, since switching to Stefan, like, what do you think... Like what are some of the changes you've made to make you improve so much every year now? Because obviously, like you're at the top level already. Like the the room for improvement is obviously like limited compared to where you were like a an amateur or whatever. What are some of the changes that you've made now to like become as good as you are becoming? Um, I would say in generally, I coach a little bit different than most of the people. Uh, for me, um, bodybuilding isn't atom physics. It's not an open heart surgery. Um, it's a quite simple process, and the most people fail in bodybuilding because they just don't have consistency. Um, uh, people in bodybuilding they tend to um, always do something different instead of doing something better. If we compare bodybuilding to other sports, like well, uh, let's say tennis, okay. A tennis player will probably uh, practice his forehand for centuries or his backhand for centuries. He's not starting to be the best in rope jumping. <laughs> he, he does the forehand and he does the backhand. Most, prob- uh, most bodybuilders always want to change their 
diet, they always want to change their training, they always want to change their drugs, they want to change everything instead focusing on the things they do and getting that better and just being consistent in that. And that's why I sometimes think that I'm a boring coach, but actually I know what leads the guys to winning. <laughs> and that's what consistency is. So for that, people need to have trust in you and people sometimes need, need to shut off the brain and just do the consistent work. And if you ask me what made him a better athlete uh, since four years ago, he's definitely doing exactly the same thing than four years ago. He's just doing them and he's getting better in doing them. He's getting better in posing. He's getting better in the training. He's getting better in the nutrition. He's getting better in giving me feedback. We are getting better um, in reading how he is is his recovery going? How is uh, the process going? How, how is his mind going? How is his motivation going? How is his self-confidence going? So we always try to get better in the things we do instead of changing things. And I think that's, um, that's always the thing which leads to, uh, leads to progression. It's, it's really not a very, very difficult thing, but, 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 but people most of the time don't have the patience and then they go into the wrong direction because they can't wait until greatness happens. Yeah, some uh, small examples are like what Stefan is saying, like you do the same things but better, like posing is such a huge thing especially for me like you can look 10 pounds bigger or five kilos bigger on stage with the same body weight but with different poses like different kind of posing so you improve the posing and every time pretty much every time that we see each other close to a show you see something in a pose you're like i try to do it like this a little bit and then we're like whoa <laughs> it changes all of a sudden like the whole thing like it started, I remember, I think it was 2022 Arnold Classic UK. I did my side relaxed poses, but I was very narrow in them. So I was very, you know, from the side, you, of course from the front you want to show a V taper, but from the side you also want to be wide and still show a small waist. But I, every time that I did the side relaxed, I couldn't really get to, the, get to it in a comfortable way. And he said, maybe if you try this and like first like uh, expand your lat and then put your arm back. And I was like, huh? all of a sudden I'm 10 times better and it's so easy to, <laughs> to do, but you need somebody who recognizes that in your physique and gives you like a hint and hey, maybe try this. And because I trust him, I of course do it. And then you can see the result immediately. And it's stuff like this compounding over the years that we've been working together that changed your physique so much even though it's mostly about the consistency and small little details here and there that you can improve on. And uh, yeah, and, and another thing is, the longer you work together, the more he gets to know my body. So at the Arnold UK in 2022, we did uh, over 90 minutes of cardio, like even less than 2000 calories, a lot of steps, which means a lot of work, not a lot of food, and pretty difficult prep. Yeah. And even I can remember when you came to me before. No, no, it was. You came to me, I think, 2021 before the Olympia, right? Yes, right. yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. And I just were, were <laughs> crapping to my head because at that point, um, Wesley came to me, I think. Um, you came to me after the win of Romania? Uh, Poland. Poland, yes, yeah. Poland, um, and like always, he, he needed to send me um, his actual diet and everything he, he, he was doing and the pictures, and he was sending me, and I think you were down at 1,700 calories, something like that, and I thought, oh, what the fuck, the guy is still fat, <laughs> and, and, and he's, he's just eating 1,700 calories, so actually we, we had a problem, but still we managed it quite good to, to, yeah. to that Olympia, um, but 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 sometimes you just need to go with what 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 the athlete comes from, and you need to pick up his history and then try to remodel and redefine it. But um, that made it so special because uh, when we come to the Arnold's prep, where we came out of the Olympia, also let's say it's the same scenario. Uh, when we started working, he came out um, of Poland and it went to the Olympia. We he came out of 1,700 calorie, and then we ended somewhere I think quite same near for the yeah. Olympia. Yeah. 
Um, and when we compare it to the Olympia 2023 and the Arnold's, I think lowest Olympia prep probably was 3,000 calorie, and we ended at lowest in the Arnold prep 4,000 calorie, because the body just redefined. And this time, I think we will have to go lower than the 4,000 again, because it's a different history behind it. So you never can, I sometimes look back to see how was the condition at that point or at that point, but you can, never can relate um, uh, the calorie intake or, or um, the steps you need to do because stress level, sleep, everything can be totally, totally different. Yeah, so pretty much we almost doubled the amount of calories I could eat. And that's always the dream of bodybuilders in a prep to still eat lots of a lot of food. Now it's all relative, of course, because when you lose fat and you're in low body fat, the feeling you have is still gonna be kind of low energy no matter what. Like but if you eat only seventeen hundred calories, there's literally nothing left for the training. At least when you have like three or four thousand you can still put a lot of it around to work out and still give it your all and I I remained a lot stronger more strength in the gym uh, better sleep because you don't go so hungry before the before going to sleep so you retain a lot more muscle more fullness and therefore your metabolism stays higher and then you can lose more fat and so with that 1700 calories uh, also in uh, our old UK it was also pretty low I was higher body fat, and now at, the, at this last Arnold, I was eating like a thousand calories more with lower body fat. So it shows you that you can do a lot if you tweak the process the right way with the right coach who can look at it objectively because as I mentioned, I messed myself up <laughs> before I got to Stefan because I was in the mindset, oh, the harder I push, the better it's gonna be. Like, that's what happens if you coach yourself. You're always like, I can be better, I can be drier. But in reality, you're actually holding water because you're doing so much and you think, oh, I, this means I'm not losing enough fat because the scale then stays the same. And in the mirror, you still look the same, but you're still holding on to stress and inflammation and stuff. But yeah, you just need somebody from the outside looking in to give you the right advice. And uh, then you can really make uh, the jump to a next level. And pretty much at almost everybody at a higher level now, it's very rare to see somebody eating very little food because to get to that high level, you need to already have experienced a good coaching like that to get to that kind of level where, where fullness and conditioning and the PK process all go right. Because if the caloric intake and the energy is so low, something is going to give. Either you're not going to be able to get a condition or you're, you will be flat or something, which means you won't be in the top spot. So, yeah, that's just kind of a natural thing to happen when you get to the top. You've got to have everything lined up properly to make it work all together. So. Also, a very important factor is um, to stay calm in the prep. So I would say the classical happening is uh, the daily fluctuations you have. And if you are, if you are a bodybuilder below uh, over 100 kilogram, daily fluctuations of one and a half kilogram are totally normal. You slept worse, your weight goes up. You had a heavy leg training, your weight goes up. You have a little bit of flu, your weight goes up. And um, if you don't stay, stay calm in that, that period or in that time, you probably always will go lower, go lower when your weight goes up. And in the end, you, you just push the, the body more to the border and he will have more stress and everything will go down. So sometimes you just have to wait and stay a little bit calm uh, to see if the body reacts. And there we come to the same point as before. People most of the time don't progress or don't show their full potential because they just don't have the patience uh, to wait until uh, greatness happens. Anyone? Hey Jay, I think you uh, uh, have yeah. some questions. But yes. uh, first to you, Stefan. How there's so many coaches out there. You got the record now, 14 or 15 at this Olympia. He's got 15 clients. Uh, how did you start with coaching, and how did you know? How many years did it take until you really become like the great coach? And what was the starting? How did you get into coaching? And uh, that's quite long ago. So uh, I was a fat. There comes now my correlation to, 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 to Norway. Um, I'm true Norwegian black metal. 
So I was playing in a black metal band since centuries, so Norway has a, a big place in my heart. Yesterday I went to uh, the street where the old shop Helvete from Euronymous from Mayhem has been, so that's something very, very special for me. But, and I was a black metal guy, fat, alcoholic, drug addicted uh, black metal guy, uh, but studying medicine, so <laughs> it was, was quite interesting because I love pathology and anatomy, cutting people off and all that stuff. Um, so I had a quite good passion to the, to the human body. Um, and then um, I never I always was fascinated by sports, especially motorsports, uh, but I never was good in sports. So I'm not really talented in, in moving myself or doing something, um, but um, I always was interested. And then I got really unhealthy because drinking 20 beers a day is not the best thing you, can, uh, you could do at that age. Um, <laughs> my brother was uh, presenting me a yearly membership for, uh, for a gym. And I went into the gym, and I don't know why, and I don't know how, but the magic happened. Um, that was the first time I th thought, at that moment I really thought that, I'm good in something. Uh, but actually in lifting weight I was really good, I was ugly as fuck, but I was good in lifting weight. Um, so I was 110 kilos super fat, and I lost from January to April down to 96 kilograms. I was doing three hours cardio a day, and I was was training. I love to squat. I love to uh, to uh, deadlift, and I was immediately really strong. I ended up lifting 300, squatting 300. Uh, but my problem was um, I had a few injuries. Um, when I started lifting, I had a part artificial knee. I had a torn chest. I had a broken shoulder. I had a broken collarbone. I had a broken spine. Um, so it turned out that I was good in training and I loved bodybuilding, but actually I was ugly as fuck. <laughs> uh, but I was, I competed two years later, won the Austrian championship. Um, still ugly, but very, very shredded. Um, that was 2005, I think, or 2006. Uh, but then I recognized um, maybe uh, keep competing isn't the right thing because I landed in hospital so many times in intensive care because I also have colitis ulcerosa, that's an autoimmune disease where you shit your own colon out, uh, which is also not very nice if that happens uh, before a show. Uh, but as I said, I was studying medicine, so I was nearly to finish. Um, so there is that medical background and there was the passion for training which I never felt before for any sport. Um, and then um, I came home from my last show which was the World Championship in Ostrava 2006. I competed in, uh, it was uh, classic bodybuilding called in the old IFBB. Okay. And I had a car accident when I came home. So I was carless and I needed to get to the gym somehow. And there was a friend who picked me up to the gym and drove me to the gym every day and he said can you help me i want to compete so actually he was my first uh, my first customer so i started coaching 2006 um, and then i found out that i have a quite good talent um, as you probably recognized i'm a little bit retarded <laughs> <laughs> um, i'm i'm asperger autist so i see people different so if i see a body i immediately know how where he can go, what can happen, how long that will take, and have the strategy in my head. I see it right away. I see it right away. So um, I saw that I have talent. Um, but back in those days, we had uh, we just had the the IFBB, uh, the amateur, and we had the NABA, and then we had the WBFF, I think, how we are, or no WBPF. Um, and back then I wasn't the best friend of the Austrian president of the IFBB because most bodybuilders switched to the NABA because I was a coach there and I organized the shows and was head judge at the universe and all of those stuff. So I never had any connection to the IFBB Pro League because I was banned from all their shows. I wasn't able to go there and blah, 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 blah. So I was very successful in the NABA. I think I'm the only guy who had woman and man overall wins at the NABA universe. I repeated that for two times, yeah. uh, but I never had the chance to, to, to show my presence in the IFPP Pro League, which is the real bodybuilding world. Mm. 
And as the fight of the IFBB Pro League and the amateur came and they split it up, um, that was 2017. 17, yeah. 17 or 18, I immediately started to produce pro cards mm -hmm. uh, because I had the competitors and then I just had some luck. Mm, well, what, what <laughs> <was that? laughs> oh, oh, oh. No, but the, the biggest luck was for me uh, that they split up, otherwise I would be in the nowhere. Mm -hmm. Because I never would have the chance to, uh, to show actually my skills. Yeah, and then um, it, it, it was a funny story. I started to, to produce some pro cards, then I started to produce some victories. Then the people always said, ah, okay, Stefan, he just can do classic bodybuilding. Ah, yeah, Stefan, he just can do bikini. Okay, this year I end with four men open, four women open, four classic yeah. one man physique, wellness to um, figure. Yeah, I think maybe we, we catch up uh, to 12. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe another bikini, then just woman phys no no chance for woman physique, so that I miss, uh, but could could turn out quite good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been amazing. That's good. One question to you, visitors. Uh, first of all, it, you gotta know, we've never seen so many people in Norway for a bodybuilding seminar <laughs> ever. <laughs> And seven weeks before the Olympia, it's like, I couldn't believe when I saw the sign, he's going to call me, what, to Norway? Seven weeks before the Olympia. So, uh, my dream when I met you, when you turned pro, I think I've said to you, I want you to win the Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Remember back in the days? Yes. But they always gave it to Bumstead. I wasn't a fan. But anyway, <laughs> now, is it possible with your physique, forget about the conditioning and all this, is your physique at this level? to beat Bumstead in seven weeks. Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will break down it in my artistic manner. <laughs> so it is not just yeah. the conditioning. But no, the no, no. If you break out in that manner, I would say Chris has the best bone structure. Period. Okay? Um, Chris has the best bone structure. Um, he has, uh, in all of his body, um, I would say if we would give 10 points, when it comes to muscle quality, he has overall his body a 7 out of 10. But very, very, uh, very, very um, equal. So his strength is his incredible bone structure and his very equal muscle density and muscle quality. When we come to Wesley, Wesley has the, the structure of the muscle. It's very unique and very beautiful. Much more beautiful than Chris. If you take a look at Chris' legs, beautiful is not the first thing you recognize when you see Chris' legs. The same goes for his arms. But he's very equal, but Wesley has some outstanding body parts. Also from the size, um, he's definitely where Chris is. So our challenge is a little bit to bring more equality of the quality in the body. And for, and for us, that means a bit, little bit more glute development, a little bit more hamstring development, same quality in glutes and hamstrings as we have in the shoulders, as we have in the arms, if, as we have in the quads. Um, because then, Wesley is supreme to Chris because he has more beautiful muscles. Still, Chris then has a better bone structure than Wesley, but then it's up to the judges. Bone structure versus beautiful muscle, which one counts more? So that's the strategy in my head, how, how we can beat him. Yeah, because if you talk about bone structure, like Ramon also, if you look at it objectively, possibly has a, if you look at the waist, the hip ratio, the ratio of the body, probably has a better one than me as well. Uh, no. <laughs> he, he, he just has different advantages of you. He has the better waist, but actually his shoulder weight width is not very good. But Chris, when it comes to Chris, and that's at the moment the reason why he is so many time Mr. Olympia, his Shoulder width compared to his um, his midsection is just when you see that life, that's just nuts. 
you know. But he has other weaknesses, and and with that we can actually uh, beat him. Yeah, because of course nobody is perfect, and yeah, the goal is to have strong points that are so much better than his weaknesses that that's going to be also the, the, the factor that they might say, okay, Wesley is just a better bodybuilder now. But yeah, like a, a bone structure is something that you're born with. So you can't really change that, of course, but you can work around it with it. So that's what uh, Tyler Mannion himself also said when I went against Ramon at the Arnold, that yes, he might have a smaller waist, but if it's about the V-taper, Wesley's shoulders and lats were so much wider that his V-taper is even better than even when, when someone has a small waist. Now, Chris, of course, has broader shoulders than Ramon, but not than me. So, <clears throat> if I think, um, if I stand next to Chris, just like what happened at the Arnold, you will see the truth. Like, of course, you never know what he's going to look like or what I'm going to look like, but I really have always believed that when I stand right next to him and I hit my pose as I'm supposed to hit him, that people who are a big fan of Chris, who think he's the best and are kind of blinded by that, that they will then be shown that it's kind of different in reality, that when somebody is standing next to him who is actually taller and heavier than him on stage at that moment, with what the plan is, ultra conditioning of course and body parts that really shine on my physique that don't shine as much on his physique like of course the other way around is the same thing but it's still classic physique we're talking about so which body part would someone rather have like a good bicep or good glutes for example Obviously, <coughs> yes but it's all about it can be too much of an extreme discrepancy so like, yes, you can have slightly smaller glutes, but if they're too small, then yeah, it's going to look weird. Mm. So you got to play with the balance, and with that, with posing, you can do a whole lot. But having said that, I know for a fact that compared to the Arnold, that that proportion has been improved already in those few months. Mm. So that's going to be showing on stage already. And um, yeah, and I usually the more condition I get, the more that shines through. Because as Stefan said, my muscles, they're clean. So every line, you can really see the separation there. So the, the drier and the leaner that I get, the more separation comes out and the bigger it actually appears. And then it's up to me to showcase that in the right way and to keep those contractions there. Any hamstrings, for example, that has always been, like when you're on stage and you're doing all the poses, you practice it at home so many times and then on stage, Sometimes it happens that you don't squeeze a certain muscle a way that you thought you did, and then the separation doesn't show as much as you wished. It's kind of small things like this on, on this level that matter a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So I think if I nail all of that, which of course we're going to do, then uh, it's going to be a very interesting battle for sure. And um, again, I, I need to have this kind of mindset. Because mm -hmm. if I want to win... I mean, it's just, to me, it's just boring. Like, I'm known as, like, more the humble guy. So, usually, I always say, oh, the best one is going to win, and I'll see what I'm going to play. So hopefully, top five, that's the goal. But I really think that this year it can happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a lot more fun when there's a little bit more of a hype and a battle going on instead of just standing there and just kind of accepting that he is going to win. No, it's not going to happen. I'm going to give him a battle. And the nice thing is that I said the exact same thing before the Arnold. I said, no, it's, just, it's not going to be Ramon who's going to win. No, it's going to be a battle. They're, he's going to have to fight to win. And the same thing will happen at the Olympia. So I think this will be his biggest challenge at the Olympia so far since battling Brion. Mm. So uh, back in uh, 2018 and 19. So it's going to be a good one. Last question for someone else take over. <laughs> if, we don't, if, if we don't fail right now, can we see some of the Zeke? Can we see it if we don't film? <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll. We want to see the body a little bit. That's what we want. Can we, if we don't film and take pictures just for us because it's going to go viral and all. Can we see some <laughs> of the could Zeke? Go, if, if the if, picture if, is if, really if, good. If, if, if it could go viral, we, we, we don't have anything to hide. You okay, know? we don't have nothing to hide. Can Never. we see it? Can we see it? Can we see it? Yeah. Make, 
you're making space already. Yeah, what is the best lighting here? This is the. This is not normal for us in Norway. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. and I'm always like, uh, like normally, I usually wear a, in things like this. I normally wear a tank top and stuff because I know. Like as a bodybuilder, you're going to a different country and then you're like all dressed up and no one actually gets to see the bodybuilder they're there for. Like I always at, at expos, I'm seeing people with all their clothes on. I'm like, why don't you show what you're known for? You know, you're, that, that's what, what you are. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. Yeah. And I want to hear, I want to hear you the crowd, hear guys. Woo! Our shows are lost or won, usually as well. For the nice open pose. Oh, nice. And then can't exclude the ultimate oral pose. He's a big one. <laughs> if anybody has the best footage, send it to me as well because I want to make like a short trip of uh, like a vlog of this uh, trip as well. So, yeah, if you got some good footage, I'll include it in there, and of course, I'll tag you guys. So, <laughs> any more questions? What's the weight right now? So weight right now is about 117 kilos. Um, so that's my weight cap for the class is 112.9. And we still have seven weeks to go, but usually, like right now, easily two kilos of water and like bloat from the intestines can come off easily, like with certain things that you pull out or vegetables you pull out. So that's already no problem. So the weight cap won't be a problem. So as I said at the beginning, it's not about the weight really. You just don't want to stress at the end that you're not going to make it. But at this rate, we're still going to make it quite easily. To give you a, a funny little story about the weight. Like in 2018, I did my first Olympia. And my weight cap back then, before they increased it, was 112. And I had a lot of trouble reaching that weight back in 2018. And I weighed more at that Olympia than I did at the last Arnold Classic. So I was shared 14th place at that Olympia. So that's why the weight on the scale is really one of the many data points you have to, uh, to see how good your physique is. It's really about yeah, the look, the pictures you take, and based on the combination, okay, which weight belongs to which look, and how are you gonna make sure you're gonna make the weight limit without the stress for me is also very important. So at the Arnold, I pretty much was wearing what I'm wearing right now, and I had a breakfast, 
and I weighed in at still like three to four pounds below the limit. So I was like, oh, no stress at all because I knew I just woke up, I can just eat my normal loading meal, which was a big carbohydrate meal, just drink water as usual. I don't even have to take anything off. I could just go there, weigh myself, okay? You can, you can compete and go back. And I had some years where I had a lot of stress making the weight, which, you know, it kind of messes maybe with your body a little bit because you're then trying to take things from the diet like, okay, let's not drink water now or, or let's fast for a little longer. But then you're, I remember, usually they say like, oh, the weigh-in is like a 3 p.m., which means, okay, um, I, if I don't know if I'm going to make the weight, I'm not going to eat until 3 p.m., but then you're sitting there and usually it takes another whole hour before you're even on the scale then. And then you're sitting there, not drinking, because you once you're sitting in, the, like, exactly as you guys are sitting here, here will be the scale and the measurement thing for the height, and you're afraid to even drink one drop because you're like, oh, if I drink something now, maybe that will be too heavy, that uh, maybe that will bring me over the edge. But so you're sitting there starving and, like, feeling weak and tired until you can weigh in, and that kind of already is like a, like that week should not have any stress at all. And that, that was always something I struggled with in terms of the stress, in terms of bringing my best physique. So now that problem pretty much since the last Olympia has been gone. So it's a huge benefit now that, yeah, the weight limit is really not an issue anymore. And you would think, oh, after 2018, you, you think you're going to increase in weight because you're adding uh, muscle, but it's all about muscle quality, adding it in the right places and just making sure that the fatigue and the stress is down, which you lose weight with that as well, and the body fat has to just be non-existent. And that gives you a lot more room to play with in the end. So, uh, yeah, very excited. I think uh, um, uh, beating the guys down in the, in the weight limit, which sometimes is the thing you have to do, always negatively infect, uh, affects uh, the body. I think that was also the main reason why um, Ramon at that um, Arnold maybe missed his peak a little bit, because when we uh, when we saw the Olympia uh, 2023 at the weight in all of the top 10 guys they even didn't had to put on their uh, put off their jumpers, because Chris Ramon all were easy in the limit, and I think at the Arnold. Um, Ramon maybe uh, missed, missed the mark a little bit. So beating down always makes it more complicated. You get the people in the class anyway. So most freakiest things I've done without diuretics would have been five kilograms a day. For example, waiting is at four o'clock in the evening and in the morning uh, you, you, you need to have 96 kilograms and in the morning you still have 102 happens <laughs> but can can be done but it definitely will negatively affect um, your physique so so uh, having the possibility to um, to eat and and uh, following your normal schedule or within the weight limit um, is always uh, a, a thing which which will affect in a much more positive uh, look Uh, except from the weight training, the cardio, and the diet, what other types of rituals do you have coming up to a competition? Uh, well, I have two children, so the rituals usually revolve around them as well. But it's actually, people, before they get children, they think it's going to be more difficult. But once you get a routine down, you actually trust me, automatically burn a lot more calories because they require attention. And what do children like to do the most? They like to move around. So <laughs> multiple little examples here, like, like the, the regular stuff. Um, we walk multiple times a day. Uh, I have a dog as well, two children. So it's not just going to be a walk around the block. You got to, like my oldest son is four, so he drives really quickly uh, in front of me. So I have to keep reeling him back in. My daughter is too slow, so she's in the back, so I have to try to take her. And then the dog is kind of sometimes barking against other dogs. So it's, like it's like a battle, like a war zone the whole round through. So you get a lot of activity in that way, and you do that at least twice a day. So uh, after breakfast and after dinner. 
um, then you already get those steps in. And those are rituals that will always remain. I think that's important for the children as well. And then also stuff like um, the children, uh, usually my, my son Dexter, he wakes up quite early. So if I want to do my cardio without stress, I gotta wake up sooner than him. So that's also part of the routine. Okay, because I wake up quite early, I have to go to bed quite early, and then you know how much time in the day I have left. So you can divide the meals exactly as you need to. But it gives you a nice, calm routine where you just get up, you do your cardio, and then the children wake up, you make their breakfast, you make your own breakfast, and you can calmly start your day. And uh, after that, you then do, the, do that walk. And then, but sometimes, I, uh, they do wake up, or I wake up a bit later, or they wake up sooner, and then I do my cardio while they play in their room. But it's like half an hour later, I check their room. And it's not as clean as before. <laughs> so it's like you're, you think you're done with cardio, but it actually then begins. Because you've got to clean everything up, like Lego pieces, like wooden blocks, like all the, the, the toys everywhere on the bed or like below the bed, everywhere. So you got to clean that up as well. Like, but it's the mindset you got to have. Am I going to see this as an annoying thing or just as an extra tool to help me get shredded for the Olympia? So I'm just looking at it as like, oh, there's extra steps, there's extra cardio. It makes the... the it makes me eat the breakfast later, which means the later I start eating, the less time I'm hungry in the day. <laughs> so you all, it's all about the mindset, uh, those things. And also, um, when I work out, um, people, if you follow me, you notice I always walk in between the steps, uh, in between the sets as well. So people, when they work out, they do a heavy set and then they like to rest for like two minutes and they just sit down. But why not just walk around a little bit and before you know it, in one workout, you can get three to even 4,000 extra steps in. And what's the nice thing about this, it doesn't cost a second extra time. You're there anyway, you have to rest anyway, so you might as well fill in that rest time with that activity. And that helps me so much not get stressed later on when I see at the end of the day, oh, I still need 4,000 steps to do. So then you gotta go outside, like before you're going to bed, still do like half an hour or 40 minutes of walking. You know, every day has to be the same consistent thing. And then like almost always when I get my last meal, I check my watch to see, okay, am I hitting those steps? Have I hit them? And then it's like, oh, I already hit them. That's such a nice thing, but it only happens if you get keep those rituals going. And um, I also take like health for me is very important. So I take a lot of supplements as well, like every single morning and with every single meal, I take those health supplements. And um, for me, it's important that, yes, we want to be the best possible bodybuilder we can be. And we know it's not always the healthiest thing, but the healthier you can stay and remain, the better it's going to be for everything. So people think, oh, building muscle, burning fat, that's what bodybuilding is about. But the healthier your body is, the better it's able to do those things as well. Because organs like the liver is like a lot of responsibility there for burning fat anyway and for glucose metabolism, for example, to give you more energy in the workout and the kidneys to not make you bloated or hold water. If those are all healthy, then you look way better. And that's why um, like if, if a lot of bodybuilders, you can see kind of on the outside on their skin, like you can see something is wrong on the inside. Sometimes you see that. So you can kind of recognize it a little bit sometimes that they, something has to change here. But um, yeah, and whenever you do a blood test, for example, you can see that you're kind of proud that everything is in a good range because you've done the best you can with the health and stuff. But uh, yeah, those are just some of the rituals I like to do every single day. But yeah, as we said before, it's consistency. That is the real key. Because uh, also here, like uh, in the morning, I have a cardio bike at home. So I just walk downstairs and do cardio right away. But here I went to a gym that had the cardio bike. So I just walked there, did the exact same cardio and then went to the apartment to have my breakfast. But that's like a very simple uh, example of the routine you've got to keep every day because we're at the Olympia prep now. You, you can't have an excuse no matter where you are in the world. You, can all, you should always do the same. I also, brought a, I also brought an extra suitcase because I literally brought the chicken from home to here, <laughs> all frozen. So I have everything here. I brought like all the supplements, like my victory breakfast, victory meals with the whey drip, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I make sure that I have all the stuff here 
or wherever I am. Like when I go to Vegas, I'm gonna take three suitcases with me to do the same thing. Cause I'm gonna stay there longer, but I make sure that everything I would do at home, I can still do in a different country as well. If you really take your job as a bodybuilder seriously, that's what you're gonna do. And there's always a possibility. So yeah, if you're not consistent like that, you will not be as good as you can be. How do you deal with stress situations and, uh, on the preparation? And, uh, about uh, day, 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 day sleep? Do you sleep, take a nap after work? Okay. work out? <laughs> There's a funny anecdote about that because he's really, I would say, that's his superpower. Every, every human being has a superpower, you know, where he's really, really good in, 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 in things. And I think stress doesn't exist for him. It's so funny because uh, we know each other now since four years or something like that. And he never had been stressed, no matter which situation. And at, before the Arnolds, uh, we, went he, we went to him uh, for a check and then a video shoot and his wife um, was cooking. And I went to her and I knocked at her shoulder and asked, is he all the time like that? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yes, we never have an argue. He's, he's, al he's always like that, he's, he, which sometimes discussed things, but, but never in a, in a manner which, which will seem to be stressful or something like that. So I really think he's, that's his superpower, that he is very objective on things which happen or not happen, but he doesn't give so much uh, attention to negative things and he doesn't um, get into a death circle of, of ne negative thinking. So he just does his jobs and that's, I think that's what his superpower is and how he deals with stress because he doesn't have stress. But <laughs> maybe... <laughs> Sorry? Maybe you keep inside now, of course, you do experience like, like you do experience a kind of stress, but it's how you deal with it that is the secret, because that it it that really is the mindset that you have about it. Because you, you can think like the example I gave before, like I have two kids. If they keep making a mess, like I just clean it up and I make a mess again, you could choose to be angry at them or just say, eh, "Can you help me clean this up again?" and just teach them a lesson and then I'm thinking, hey, these are like uh, 100 extra steps for me. Like, there's always a positive effort behind every negative. Always. Like, you gotta find it and then use that positive and then all of a sudden it's so much easier to do. Like, also things, and I kind of should do this more often, but like the chores in the house, like doing vacuum cleaning or cleaning in general. Yeah, before you do it, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. But if you beforehand think about after this, and I look at my watch, uh, it's going to have 2,000 extra steps on it. <laughs> and at the same time, it's efficient because you clean the house and you make your wife happy. It's a win-win-win situation. <laughs> so uh, stuff like this, that's how I think about it always. Like, like sometimes I also, I see, uh, I live, we uh, sleep in the attic and next to the attic is the laundry room. And I open the laundry room sometimes to grab something and I see, ooh, there's a lot of laundry here. And they were immediately like, ah, oh, Marley is going to clean it. But sometimes they're like, oh, why not? I'm here now. I might as well do this. And then it, like you're busier for half an hour. So even if you're hungry, you're like, oh, this takes away time that I'm thinking about the food. I'm active now. And I, I clean it up. And it saves her time. So it's like, it's, of course, it's difficult when I say this that you to do it for yourself. But if you start small it will grow bigger and you can apply it to pretty much everything in your life. And as Stefan alluded to before as well, getting into this, 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 this circle of negativity, like the name it says it itself says it already, like you start with one thing and if you start to worry about that, you worry about this and that and that and keeps going and the end result, is it ever positive? I'm like, will stressing about this bring me any solution? And then you're like, no, it's not going to give me anything bonus. So why why even stress about it? Why not think about a solution that can help me with it and just get it done and think about what positives it does give me? So the only stressful thing I experienced before when the children were young is the, the sleep. Because um, they didn't, at the beginning, babies never sleep well. So... As a bodybuilder, there was always one thing I wanted to keep 
uh, intact and that was my night's rest because if during the day you experience kind of all these stress points but you don't let it get to you the most important thing then at least i know in the night i can go to sleep and wake up energized but if you then get waken up multiple times a night by a crying baby uh, it can be a little difficult then but uh, even then there are ways around that as well um, but that was the most stressful time in my life when prepping like both my children were born in a prep so I was like for example uh, right now we're like uh, in a situation like I'm in prep now and now for example tomorrow Dexter will be born my son that was a situation like at the first Olympia like in uh, yeah, the when he was born I did an Olympia prep so and it actually kind of went wrong in that prep as well where I uh, partially torn a muscle even because I kept training as hard as I can with no sleep I mean that was to me also you could see you could see that as a negative but I always thought I was indestructible until that moment happened and then I was like okay now I know for sure sleep is important lesson checked off now you know that and you take sleep more seriously then than you would ever if it never happened so if that never happened to me I might have been happy with like six hours of sleep because yeah it's enough sleep i feel fine but now i'm going for eight hours because i know short sleep messes my body up so much that i now experience that i had a torn muscle i like luckily you can't see it it was in the hamstring like partially torn like a few centimeters it hurt like hell you can't see it but it was like, ooh, uh, if, if, it, if it really torn big time, it would have messed my, up my career, maybe. So that was just a big lesson for me, that even the most stressful moment in my career then taught me a lesson that I could uh, take a positive out of. So that's kind of how I deal with that kind of stuff. How about nap, daytime sleep? No, I, 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 I don't think, maybe the only time in my life I've ever taken a nap is when I'm sick. Like, otherwise, I've never taken a nap in my life. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, probably in 10 years, maybe. And uh, once the children are gone, I'm like, oh, finally, I can relax. But, uh, but for now, we're still going to keep going. Any questions? How did you choose bodybuilding? How I chose bodybuilding? Yeah. So I started when I was 14 years old. And I'm 31 now, so 17 years ago. But 14 was the age that was I was allowed legally to train in the gym. If you were younger than this, back then they believed that it would stunt your growth. That it would not be good for your bones and the tendons and the joints when you're so young. Even though that's not true at all. But uh, my dad always used to be uh, uh, yeah, not really a bodybuilder, but he was a big guy. Very strong. I looked up to him because he was big strong and everybody like when i went to school i was always proud hey that's my dad because he was like the biggest bigger guy there and uh, i always watched like uh, superman x-man dragon ball z and all of those guys had one thing in common that was the head role the hero was always muscular and i was like i want to be like that as well because i associated that with something positive like if you want something you got to have muscles and then you get it that's how you think as a young guy. I didn't even do it for girls or anything because, yeah, as ultimately uh, we all know, like only the guys are interested <laughs> in those muscles in the end. But uh, I, I did it really because I never knew what I wanted to do in my life. I did gymnastics before for four years, but I find I didn't really enjoy it. And I, but my parents did say, you gotta do some kind of sport. So I knew my dad was working out in the gym, so that's when I decided, okay, let's work out. But the first six months was actually quite boring to me because I was working out, but I didn't see anything changing. Of course, my nutrition was horrible, so that had maybe had something to do with it, but I didn't really see anything until I all of a sudden saw that I was getting stronger and I was getting bigger. And then it started to become fun because the only fun thing about something is if you make progress. So then I turned 15, 16, 17, and all of a sudden, I was a quite a big guy already, and people started to ask me, hey, how do you, uh, how do, you do this? How do you do that? Uh, what are you using? <laughs> Questions like this. I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't, I'm coming from like a farmer's town in the Netherlands. Like I didn't even know what they were talking about. And I, all, I, I thought Ronnie Coleman was natural, for example. <laughs> like 
that's the guy I was. I, I never, I, I didn't know anything about bodybuilding. I just knew I loved to train. That's how I started. I loved that feeling. I worked out with my dad and my brother. My brother, uh, one and a half years younger than me, he did the exact same thing as me. He was as strong as me, as big as me. So we worked out for a lot of years together. So um, after a while, like uh, I, we moved houses to a bigger city. And in that city was a bigger gym with more hardcore bodybuilders. And there was one bodybuilder there who said, why don't you do competitions? Because you look quite big and you're very lean naturally. Because I still didn't eat very good. But because of that, I didn't eat enough. So I was very lean. So you could see every muscle by nature already without having to try for it. So he was like, why don't you do competitions? I'm like, no, I'm not Ronnie Coleman. I'm not Jay Cutler because I watched YouTube and the only competition I thought existed was the Mr. Olympia. Because just like as a kid, when you watch the Olympic Games, you think this is the competition and there's nothing else. That's what, you, that's what I thought at least. I was like, okay, you gotta be this good or you're not gonna be able to do it. But then he showed me a poster in that gym on the wall and it showed an amateur competition and the physiques that were there from last year. Then I was like, oh, wait a second, if those guys look like this, then I could stand with them. And then he said, if you're going to do this competition, I'm going to coach you for free for this competition because he really wanted to see what I was going to look like and he was going to do that competition himself as well. So he was going to do the super heavyweight, I was going to do the junior competition. So I went home and I asked my parents, um, do you think uh, it's a good idea for me to do a bodybuilding show? And they were first surprised because I was, I still am, quite of an introverted person. So I never really was somebody who was comfortable in front of like a super big audience or whenever I had to do a presentation, I was very nervous and stuff like this as a kid. So they were kind of surprised, but bodybuilding I felt confident in. I knew a lot about it already from just experience and uh, they said yes of course why not you never know what's going to happen so that's when i did the competition as a junior and i won the overall as a junior then and then uh, of course when you win once you're gonna want to do it again so that that's when i took it really seriously with nutrition supplements training like my life was then about bodybuilding way more than the year before and i was 20 years old when i won my first competition and then I did another competition, the same one, but at a higher level. So this time I didn't only beat the junior guys, but also the adults as a 21 year old. So I kept winning all the shows until the highest Dutch level and in, already in 2014. So I, I, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do now? So then I did the uh, Arnold Classic in 2016, uh, the European Championships. And then I got uh, fifth place as a junior, and that's the first time in my life that I experienced not being number one. And that's when I got motivated to wait a second, the Netherlands is quite small. Outside of the Netherlands, there's a lot more competition here. And that's when I started to uh, get, get a coach and, uh, and really get better in bodybuilding itself. And uh, before you know it, Classic Physique came around, and that's when my whole career lifted off, basically. Yeah. Denna episoden är sponsrad av The Shock Factor, som utan konkurrens lagar Norges råaste töj för alla oss gymrotter. Med kul design, perfekt passform och daily stoff är det väldigt svårt att inte digga Shock Factors inne kollektioner. I tillägg är det knallgod kvalitet till meget konkurrensduktiga priser. Om du utöver oversized och pump covers, då är old school eller graphic kollektionerna nog för dig, med mängder av kul design och välja mellan. För dig som vill ha något lätt och behagligt träningsstöj så är performancekollektionen ett sällsakt valk. Så ta turen inom shockfactor.com och beställ dina favoriter. Husta och bruka koden GYMBROS när du checkar ut så får du 10% avslag på priset. Alltså koden GYMBROS ger dig 10% avslag på prisen hos shockfactor.com. Next question. Uh, maybe Stefan, uh, what's the toughest part about coaching wrestling? If there is any. Boring. <laughs> 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 
I really have to think about it. Because there are, are always tough things. There must be something. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the only thing is sometimes that I get a little bit angry about him. Um, it was the Arnold's UK, where I was not happy uh, with with, but, but it was a total new situation, so I understand it. Uh, but when he went into the Arnold's uh, Ohio, he was totally fresh in his mind. Um, he had the will to win and then he won. So actually from the mindset that was quite easy uh, because he had nothing to lose going there. Uh, when he uh, went to the to Arnold's UK, um, you know, people were talking he shouldn't have won and blah, blah, blah. And you want to repeat that. And um, I was a little bit angry is the false word, but but a little bit frustrated because he didn't display his best at the Arnold UK pre-judging. Not because of his body, uh, but he was a little bit a shy sheep, <laughs> if I can say it like that. And um, the people who know me, I'm, I'm very direct even in competition situations. So um, I immediately go to the people or even write them during the year on stage and give my feedback <laughs> and then I think I went to him and said what the hell are you doing here <laughs> um, um, that needs to 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 get better in the evening uh, just stop stop thinking and and get back to your dominance and get back to your strength and and and, and kill that fucking shit so actually that was the only thing um, where which was a little bit Tough isn't the right word, but the only thing which which has a little bit negative thinking of when it comes to 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 Wesley, because actually he always executes. There is um, no. the, there is not really anything. Yeah, because my I think my biggest downfall would be like that's why I have the mindset now for the Olympia that's so strong. Like I won the Arnold Ohio, and of course. You, you come there with no real expectations that are so high, but once you then beat everybody, you're like, oh, it's like uh, something's lifted off of your shoulder. And then the next week you're like, oh, I'm just gonna repeat this. But you should not, never think like this because then you're like standing in the pre-judging and the, the head judge was very smart because he they played a game. They did not put me in the middle this time at all. And I was like, damn. I'm not showing apparently the same confidence as before and I'm now on the outside and that only made it worse of course I was like how can this be there's no way that I know I don't look worse but they still didn't put me there and this is why presentation is so important and then uh, that was a pre-judging and then the finals we turned it around so much because in between Ohio and the UK uh, my, he said at the Ohio competition your posing routine has to change because it's too boring. Like you always pose to classical music and like the, the the cinematic music from the movies. But you're a metal guy. Why don't you do something with with heavy metal? And I was like, okay, finally somebody says it to me because I was always insecure about oh, people don't always like metal and yeah, it's what I like, but maybe the audience doesn't like it. But then I was like, no, we're just gonna go for it. I'm gonna show it at the UK. And uh, we already made that posing music, and I was gonna pose to it. And but Stefan told me, okay, please, please, for me, really showcase how dominant you are at the finals at your routine. Show that you're the winner. And luckily, we had that metal song because it was perfect to bring it all out. And I expl <laughs> yeah, I exploded on stage with the posing, and it made it so much easier because the moment I heard that metal song. Like when I like a song, like you guys all know, if you work out and you like a song, you can work out harder. It's the same with posing. You can pose much harder and it doesn't even feel difficult. You're like, everything was exploding. But I remember I did the most muscular and then I walked across the stage and I wanted to do like this, like cheer the audience on, but I was like, I can't lift my arm almost because it was empty. I didn't realize I was doing it so intensely that 
I did this f motion, but it felt like my arm was sleeping. <laughs> I was like, oh, damn, damn wait a second. Uh, I hope this looks uh, decent now, but it, it went perfectly. But it does show you that you can put so much more into it when someone is, yeah, once again, so caring about your performance and knows what you have, what you have inside of you. And he really allowed me to bring it out. And everything came together then. And I got, sh and I, the audience went so crazy when I, when I did that. We like, were, I was there actually. Oh yeah, oh we nice. Had chills. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have chills right now actually. <laughs> and the funny thing is, the Arnold Ohio is seen as the biggest Arnold, but after the Arnold UK, I had a way bigger response after that, after winning that, because I went on stage, and after that, maybe you saw that as well. A lot of people came to me, like a huge crowd came to me, all wanted to shake my hand and fist bump and take pictures. It was like. It felt like I was Arnold almost. Like yeah. it was crazy. Everybody was walking over each other and pushing each other away just to give me a handshake. I mean, why? I'm just me, you know? Yeah. But it was like a very unique feeling that it was like, okay, this, yes, this is what I need to do. So for the Olympia, you if if you're not there, just watch the live stream in the finals because that routine will be an even higher level than what I did at the UK. Because uh, I know that works. And I know exactly what kind of music I need to do now and what kind of posing works for me. So it's going to be an explosive posing routine, let's just say that. I never get my Norwegian black metal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wesley, how did it feel hearing from Arnold that you were the return to the golden era of bodybuilding? Yeah, that was just incredible. I mean, it still feels surreal to think about it because everything happened so quickly for me. Like, in the finals, there was a final call between me and Ramon. So, back then, it was still a question, okay, am I going to get first or second? But honestly, knowing myself, I thought, oh, they're going to give it to Ramon. He's the two-time winner or the previous year's winner already. Um, this is, I, I, I already beat so many guys, even if I get second. So, everybody will be happy, even if I get second anyway. So, I didn't even expect to win to be very honest, but if I look back at the footage, okay, then I, I'm like, okay, yes, I actually did win, but at that moment, you still never really can believe that they will give it to you, because that means if you win, then Arnold will give you the award, and you, you do a speech with Arnold. So I stand there, and Bob Ciccarello, the MC, is like, and uh, second place goes to Ramon, and I was like, I could not believe what I was hearing. But like five seconds later, you see Arnold walking up the stairs, as I was in disbelief from the victory itself. And he comes there, he, he, they tell me to go in the middle of the stage, and you can see Arnold holding the trophy. And you're like, within like 10 seconds of hearing that I'm winning, he's already talking about my victory and comparing me to a golden era bodybuilding and giving all his compliments. I'm like, well, this is almost too much to handle because you gotta realize Arnold has always been my idol in classic bodybuilding. Like, whenever I see his posing, how he trains, and how he talks about bodybuilding, it's so special to me. You can see, and you only know this when you try it yourself, when you try to do his routine and his posing style, it's so much more difficult than it looks, because that's the illusion. You, he makes it look very easy, but it's so difficult to, except for me, I'm like a, a wooden plank. It used to be like <laughs> hard, a robot in posing. So for me to pose a little bit like him was so difficult already. So I realized how much effort he put into that, how much practice and how meticulous he was about showcasing the perfect physique in his eyes. So, and he just stands, he is the golden era bodybuilder of all of them for me. Like with, when I think about classic physique, I think about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like other people think about the aesthetic guys, but if you have Arnold standing with a frontal bicep, there is no one who beats that, no one in my opinion. So I just think that looks the best. And um, when when he tells me that I am like that, that's just the biggest compliment I can ever get because who else is more authentic than that? You know, there's no one else left to say that who you are more proud of to hear it from. So when he said that, it was just an incredible feeling. And um, yeah, like the, the two days later, the, the show was on a Friday. And two days later was a superstar seminar 
where we were sitting here on the couch, but like you had Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler, Lee Haney, like Hadi, who won his coach, and of course Arnold. Uh, like a lot of like there were like 30 I feel he like 30 plus Olympia titles on stage at the same moment and then it was me as well so I felt like super honored to be part of that and then he, he, even then he said that he loved my posing like the way that I represent the sport and then we talked a little bit about the next show which would be the Arnold Classic UK and he said I expect you to be there like in his Arnold style and I was like okay I gotta do it I gotta do it again so it was just a very very special feeling and also that he remembered me at the UK Arnold when I won he said hey you did it you won again and he was like it was it was incredible even though he we didn't do a speech then because apparently he was a little sick so he just gave the award and went away but at least he still told me yeah you did it again man congratulations you did it twice and to hear it from him, knowing that he's also a bodybuilder who just kept winning and winning and winning back in his day. So that was just a super motivating effect it had on me, and I'll never forget it. And uh, yeah, it will always have a special place for me because like, Stefan actually is the one who told me, like I think already a few years ago, if there is any show for you to win, it's the Arnold. It's like if you have to choose between the Olympia and the Arnold, for you it's the Arnold. And that, yeah, now that I won it, it's like, well, f we did it. We did it. We made it happen. So, uh, yeah, just incredibly special for me. Next question. No more questions? Yeah. Uh, how long do you think you will be able to compete? You're 31, you said? Yeah, so before the Arnold, I always thought 35 because I always said, if I don't achieve what I want to achieve before turning 35, am I really going to do it after that? Am I really going to, you know, I've already been doing competitions since I was 20. So 15 years later, I'm still going to make enough improvements to beat like the young guys then. But now that I won the Arnold, of course, it opens up everything again. So every year I'm going to reevaluate it. And um, now it becomes, again, easier because the ch children are now old enough so that... I don't have any uh, sleep issues from that anymore. So that also has had to play a part for the oral. It was the first prep I've ever done uh, after having children that I could was able to sleep. Because all the other preps, like first Dexter was born, then it took like a year for him to sleep, good. And then right after that, then Lara, my daughter was born. So another extra year. So it was like uh, a roller coaster of not sleeping for uh, yeah, pretty much two years straight. And, uh, but this was the first prep I was able to sleep, which makes the shape a lot better, of course. So now I'm like, well, it's, if health stays intact, I also I don't only do blood work, but also the organ imaging, which um, it shows you like a true image. Are you healthy or not? I mean, if you test all of that and your blood work and it's good, at least health wise, there's no reason to stop. And if you feel good, if you have no injuries, I mean, I feel better than ever, basically. Not, no injuries at all anywhere. It's, 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 training is going really well. Strength is going, staying high, even in the prep. So, yeah, I, I don't really see an ending date. And you have some examples, like a Brian. I think he's like 44 or something. Okay. I mean, right now, he, like, at the last competition, he was number two. So he's still really much a top five guy in the world at his age. And that, that's still 14 years older, 13, 14 years older than I am right now. So who knows how long it's going to take. But yeah, the most important thing is I should not regress. I should always be able to improve and stay healthy. And I have to, it has to be fun, of course. As long as those things stay intact, then uh, there's still no really end, no set end date right now, at least. Yeah. Anyone else? So backstage, it's always smart to focus on yourself. So what I do, 
I go backstage, you see all the other guys, you say hi to people who are not laying down or don't have their eyes, eyes closed, but it's backstage, you're really still in your own zone before the prejudging, before you're going on stage, because everybody is still really focused. They don't know how the call-outs are gonna be yet, so no one is really talking with each other, maybe a few words here and there. But what I like to do is I just lay down I just look at my watch, okay, we have so much time left, and I already have everything prepared, so I already have my posing trunk on, I make sure to have the number already on, so the only thing I have to do is just take off the clothes, warm up, get the glazed, and then I'm done. So I know that once I just put some music on, I lay down, and usually I just keep envisioning the, the presentation round, which means the first time you get on stage, uh, to showcase yourself, you have 60 seconds, just about, to show your first impression. So those poses go through my head first. So the, the, the keep thinking, okay, what am I going to show? I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. On music, so you're kind of staying motivated and staying hyped for it. But you still, I just lay there with my eyes closed. I don't really pay attention to anybody then. And uh, I just wait until the people backstage say, okay, classic physique, line up or get ready, start getting glazed, and then you just slowly get up. Then I start warming up a little bit. I like to keep my clothes on for as long as possible to stay warm because sometimes it's cold backstage. They like open the, the biggest door there that, to go, that goes all the way to the ceiling. And it's like, it's the opposite of what we want. We, want we, we would rather have it hot here than cold because we all know a pump is very difficult to hold when you're cold. So I, I pump up with a vest on and a, and a joggers on like this. And uh, when I feel pumped, then I go to the glazing uh, people to put uh, the oil on. And when you got the oil on, you stay warmer as well. So they just keep a little bit the blood flowing. And then you still don't really communicate with, <laughs> with anybody. Everybody's really in their own zone. Um, yeah, and once you get on stage, and you get back backstage to wait for like the real comparisons, you already kind of start, then the first nerves or the excitement is already gone because you've, you've been there, you saw the crowd's reaction, you maybe already saw some pictures here or there or got feedback from the coach, and then you feel a bit more relaxed and then you start talking a bit more. Usually I talk with Urs, for example, because he's my teammate, I know him well, or some, or Terence Ruffin or Brian, I know them better than the other guys. Like Chris Baumstead usually is always by himself. It's usually always, because he has a team around him, like his coach and his girlfriend, everybody is allowed with him. We are not allowed to have anybody, so <laughs> maybe that's why. But, uh, but we played the game at the Arnold. Huh? But at the Arnold we played that game. Yes, also. yes, yes. He was not, he was not allowed in. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. But uh, yeah, but usually um, after the pre-judging and people are happy with with how the pre-judging went then you have like fun talk backstage and you're like friendly but also sometimes people leave like some people leave right away they are not social at all like they're not happy with how it went or they got instructed from the coach or something but mostly what goes through my mind is i keep looking at my legs to see okay is the shape still there i'm still seeing the detail that I know it has to be there. If the detail is there in that specific part, I know the rest is good as well. That's what I know, I know about your own body. You know, okay, look at the bicep. Can I see like this bicep split and, and all of that stuff? Then you know, okay, the conditioning is there, the shape is there. Do I feel still full? Um, that's the kind of things you kind of look for backstage. And for the rest, you really just relax. You, you don't go on social media. You don't really go on your phone only to listen to a little bit of music and um, just really focus on what will you show on stage and right before going on stage like I used to be a bit more nervous but when I'm on the stairs it's like empty it's like I'm just smiling okay I'm going on stage you know so well what you're going to do that it's, you don't have to think about it you're just waiting okay they come like the guy says okay now it's your turn you just step on stage and it happens like a robot basically but that's where my mistake used to be i did it too much as a robot which means i didn't play with the crowd i didn't really show the mimicking in my face as much which i'm gonna do differently now um to really like 
uh, you're always afraid that the MC is going to say, okay, Wesley, you're done, now it's the next guy. But when you're playing with the crowd and you're giving them entertainment, they're going to keep you on stage, do a little bit more. Then that you've got to take that advantage, that opportunity as well. So, um, yeah, that, that's basically how it goes in the pre-judging and in the finals, everybody is more relaxed. Like everybody, you're talking way more, and in the finals, you already did the most important part. So then you also know after the finals, like funny, before you even go on stage at the finals, we already discuss where are you going to eat afterwards? <laughs> like which buffet or which place are you gonna go to? Or wh where did you go? Which restaurants we had bookmarked on Google Maps? And like funny stuff like this. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's really, for me, it's, it's always a very nice experience backstage. I've never experienced anything bad at all, except for sometimes it's the environment itself is not really in conducive for the best pump or it's cold or stuff like this. But other than that, it's, uh, it's pretty good for me. I just stay in my own world and uh, do my thing. How many days are you training in a week? And tell us about uh, your work on. So I train uh, three days on, one day off. So it's kind of like um, legs, push, pull, le uh, split, and then the rest. So um, with the legs, I do the most volume because they require the most work. And then uh, my push workout is the least volume as this is pretty much good for me already. It just needs to maintain the, the size and the back is a bigger muscle. So it's, it's, it has a bit, bit more volume. And usually I have like A and B workouts. So let's just say you have one specific leg workout. You call it uh, leg workout A with certain exercises. And I log them in my logbook. And then you have leg workout B, which is also a specific set of exercises. Then you always do, you, like if you train uh, twice a week a muscle group and you do the same movements, you're going to get you're gonna plateau really quickly because it's the same movement you can't get stronger the whole time so you have to switch up the movements here and there as well so um that's why i, I used to train like six times a week and the seventh day i still went to the gym to train abs and uh, forearms or something or calves just because i could and i wanted to but what i do now is um i go to the gym three three times and always a rest day and maybe even an extra rest day if me and Stefan agree okay we need a bit extra time or two rest days in a row sometimes like if you take one rest day and you still if you have a doubt about am I rested enough just take another rest day that's magic after two rest days it's kind of a magical effect because then you feel so motivated to train again and you will have a lot of weeks again of good training just for one extra day of rest and that is what a lot of people forget. And it's funny because I uh, did cardio this morning in the gym and someone came up to me. He was like, how uh, many times a, a, a week do you think I have to train to become like you? <laughs> I was like a maximum five. I was like, I used to train like six, seven times a week. But he was like, oh, so two rest days? I'm like, yeah, because in the rest, that's when you grow. And also the nights you have to sleep because during the sleep, that's when you recover. If the recovery and the rest are not there, you can work out as much as you want. You're only going to go backwards. So that's why I always have the three days on, one day off at least. And uh, if any extra rest days have to happen, I do that. But I never do four days in a row because for me, it's, it's just too much. I know if I do that too long, it's not going to get my physique to the next level. And every pro bodybuilder, when I was younger, told me, when I told them I'm training six days a week, they're like, why don't you train less? You're training too much. I train three or four or five times. I, I take more rest days than you. And they were like much bigger, but I didn't want to hear it because I lo love training so much. And that's the problem. You got to disentangle the love for training with what is the most optimal thing if you're serious about making the most gains. And usually, if you th still think training is fun after the sixth day of training, you're not training hard enough. Because it's not going to be fun then. You're really going to feel beat up, for sure. So every training has to be to the max, especially in the off-season. And then you want that rest day. And after the rest day, you feel motivated again to go hard again. At, at again. So yeah, that's basically uh, my uh, my workout split. Stefan, yes. uh, how do you manage to coach so many different uh, body groups? Um, I do nothing different, uh, nothing else, <laughs> I would say, it's just 
just um, had a walk with my wife in the morning. She came, she came here, and I said, uh, "I don't feel well. I, I I need to get a sleep because we, when I went before I came there, I had a, a nap of thirty minutes." Um, because she, she said that, yeah, what do we expect? You do nothing else is work. Um, I have been the whole night up because there's the rising phoenix. Um, people need to compete. People need to get their decisions. And I spent about 100 hours a week with working. And that I do since now 17 years, something about that. Uh, but actually, it's, it's, it's not tough for me just sometimes when I get really tired. So you see my eyes are a little, um, because um, I have the biggest luck in the world. I, I, I was able to, to make my biggest passion to, to actually my job. So it, it doesn't feel like, uh, like work because if I wouldn't get money for it, I still would do the same. So it's, it's actually not work because uh, I love to change bodies. I love to, to, to develop strategies to, to, to change uh, bodies, that's how I deal it, that's the first thing. And the second thing is um, I don't waste time with unnecessary things, even when it's in coaching. Sometimes people don't understand it, um, but uh, the quality of a coach is uh, the quality to make the right decisions. The quality of a coach is not uh, to write down a plan with the most tasty meals. I don't give a shit of tasty meals. Um, the food has to work and my job is to say when he has to eat more or to eat less or to make a rest or not to make a rest or when it's time to compete or when it's not time to compete it's not my job to make it beautiful for the people because if I would waste my time for that I wouldn't have the time to do the right decisions and the right decisions is what makes the people better so uh, during the th process you you need need to learn what actually is the job of a coach. The job of a coach is to lead the people and make the right decisions um, and not to do the unnecessary things and write the training split anew every three weeks just to keep the people entertained because I'm, as I said, not an entertainer. Um, I'm here to do decisions and the combination of, of my passion for doing it and to do it very, very efficient. Um, I think that um, is the main thing uh, why I can coach uh, some people. And every competitor is different, so do you have to adjust yes, to that? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, actually, like I said before, um, bodybuilding is not a atom physics and, and um, the basic principles of heart training, recovery, rest and food are the same for everything. The individual thing of, of, of coaching is always when do things change? And that decision is always a very personal one. Uh, but a lot of people could have at the moment the same nutrition plan or the same training plan. The question is always when does that need to change to get to a, to a new level? Uh, Stefan, what are your requirements for taking on an athlete? If it clicks, so I totally don't take care if it's an Olympia winning physique or a super fat bastard um, who, who just wants to get in shape. If the goal set is right, which doesn't mean the 700 guy who is writing me, he wants to get Mr. Olympia. Um, it's, it's, it's more, yeah, yeah, I'm fat, I know, I just want to get the best person out of myself. So realistic goal setting and the nice type of writing, um, being realistic is the only thing which, which I need because actually, as you can imagine, I spend a lot of time with those people. And if those people are not nice and I don't like them, I won't spend time with them. So that's the main thing. So it's it's really less about um, which quality do you have as a bodybuilder. It's more which quality do you have as a human being. Sometimes there are a few exceptions where because there are sometimes people or, or projects you wish you would get a chance to do with it then it's sometimes okay that you don't like them. Um, 
but the main projects need to be um, just nice, nice relationships. Um, I uh, actually quite early on already because Dennis James, who is also a pro bodybuilder, back in 2014, back when he was still even more huge, he's still pretty big, but then he was huge. He was actually coming. He was there at the, the Dutch competition I won, and he told me, "You have it, what it takes to be pro, to a professional bodybuilder." And also Barry De May was uh, third at the Mr. Olympia as well, uh, back in the uh, 90s, 80s, somewhere, 90s, I think. And um, he uh, also told me, uh, you have what it takes to be pro. So very experienced professional bodybuilders told me I got to be a pro. And of course, if you then win shows the whole time, you're like, okay, maybe I do have some kind of talent for this. But it was when, um, when you're confronted with the rest of the world, when I started my YouTube channel and social media, when you get comments from people from all over the world, and then most of them were nice about what I was doing on stage throughout the years, then you really start to believe, maybe I can really make it to a higher and higher level. But I really realized it when I, in 2018, when I won my pro card, and at the first classic physique show ever in Europe, I won my pro card there, as uh, <laughs> you were, you know, yeah. And then I won my pro, uh, won my first pro show, the right the first time in Chicago, and qualified for the Olympia all in the same year. So then I realized, okay, uh, I literally am now one of the Olympians. So it went so quick, and I'm still very grateful for it. I never take anything for granted, but at the same time, there has to be a balance between being humble about it, but also being a bit more aggressive That because you can get there, so do it. So it's like the, the, the good balance to have, but that's, yeah, I think 2014, the seed was planted because otherwise I would not have done so many shows to ultimately get to winning my pro card and getting to the Olympia. So it was yeah pretty much after my winning my second show that I realized there is something maybe special here for the future. What is your go-to cheat meal after a long prep? <laughs> it changes every time. Um, when the first time I went to America, my coach back then, who was a different coach, he said, you should try Cheesecake Factory. He was raving about it the whole time, even in the Netherlands, or in Belgium, actually. And uh, we, we after Chicago, we went there, and I was like... Mind you, I was in America, but I have never been to a restaurant before there until I won the show because that's the first time I can eat something outside of the diet. So I didn't know about the portion size difference <laughs> between the Dutch portion sizes and the American portion sizes. So I just ordered like a regular starter and a side of sweet potato fries at Cheesecake Factory. And I think, okay, this is a nice small thing to start with. Well, that plate, it was, yeah, it was like bigger than than pretty much a chair you're sitting on. It was like filled to the brim with sweet potato fries. I'm like, normally I'm quite proud of myself of eating everything that's being served to me, but I can't. I can't. It's too much. So it's like, you order something for you, but it's actually a sharing platter for the whole, uh, yeah, people you're with. And um, so I did Cheesecake Factory a couple of times because I came to enjoy the extensive menu they had there. Like, obviously, it's called Cheesecake Factory, so the dessert was always a delicious cheesecake, of which I don't only eat my slice, but also half of my girlfriend's slice. And a lot of people can't finish it, so I, they always shove it to me. And I'm always like the infinite dumpster container where they can put everything in. And I eat it also, as stupid as I am back then. Um, but I, also, I always loved sushi as well. Back, uh, I used to first go to sushi buffet restaurants where you could, it's an all you can eat. But once I got a little bit more money from bodybuilding, I was like, okay, let's do it more in a special way. So let's go to a sushi, uh, like um, 
like a real diner where you have to pay by the roll. Well, the price was a little higher <laughs> than I thought because sushi doesn't really fill up as much until you eat a lot of it. And even one of the sushi rolls, because I had to take it, it was like a golden sushi. And we all know I like to stay golden. So I had to take it, but it was like literal with gold leaf, like decorated, and that's super expensive. <laughs> it doesn't taste like anything, but you pay for the gold. I'm like, oh damn, it's uh, like uh, like 60 euros for like a, one roll. But uh, I did it anyway. And But I recently went to South Korea and I experienced Korean barbecue for the first time. Ooh, and if you've not experienced this before, authentically, I really, if you, if you like meat, if you like barbecue and you like variety of all the different flavors, that's really incredible. So uh, we already, of course, uh, looked up if Las Vegas has high quality uh, Korean barbecue places, and they do, like uh, 20 of them. So, <laughs> And the nice thing about Vegas, as opposed to like Orlando, I mean, uh, to uh, Ohio, where the Arnold was, like Ohio, if you win the show or you do the show and afterwards, you, you, there's no real place open anymore, but Las Vegas is 24 seven. So basically, no matter how late you're done, you can always find a place. So we know we can still find a very good place after uh, after uh, doing the Mr. Olympia. So it's probably gonna be something like that. Because uh, me, it's just gonna be me, my girlfriend, my cameraman, and maybe depending on everybody else's schedule and depending on the, the outcome of the Olympia, of course, it kind of depends on everything is going. But usually when we, after a competition, it's kind of a small group. And uh, I know that everybody, at least in that group, loves now the Korean barbecue, so it's going to be great. And we also had a Brazilian Brazilian steakhouse, I think it was called. There was also like a lot of different meats and stuff. That's what I like as well. Like even though I uh, it's a cheat meal, I still look at the protein. So it has to have a lot of protein because even the Cheesecake Factory. I always order something from the menu that has a lot of chicken in it or a lot of beef in it. It has to have a lot of protein. That's the first thing. And then all that's on top. That's a bonus. But the protein is, as a bodybuilder, always the main component. I never order like a ravioli or something as my main because I know there's no, there's no protein in there. So it's like even though it doesn't matter at all at that point, it's still something that matters to me. But it's going to be something like uh, more special this time as opposed to like the basic Cheesecake Factory every single time. Yeah. Do you meet prep for the whole week or you make food every day? Uh, pretty much every day. I like to make it fresh. So I make my food um, the moment I need to eat a meal, I make it. Unless I'm like traveling, then I make uh, two to three meals in advance if I know, okay, I'm going to travel for a few hours. I always prepare what I need and an extra meal to be sure and some ESN samples with extra isoclear or designer whey as always a very easy protein source to have on the road. But uh, usually I like to uh, prepare everything fresh. The only thing I prepare in advance is the vegetables. So I cut them up, put them in big containers, put them in the fridge so I can just dump them out in the pan whenever I need them. So it doesn't take as much time every single meal. But to me, there's a difference uh, when you prepare something fresh, you can put fresh herbs in there. It tastes better than to reheat it again, and it's not really having the original structure of the vegetable or whatever you're eating anymore. It's kind of all mushed up a little bit. But of course, if you're working from, if you're at home and you have to work somewhere else, you don't have a choice to prepare everything. And that's when I went to uh, to a university, for example. I used to prepare everything to the uh, not not a lot of fun comments of people around me when I opened those Tupperware containers. Back then it was like the broccoli, <laughs> broccoli meals. And when you prepare broccoli, and I, I didn't put them, I didn't steam them, I actually baked them. And you guys know if you bake broccoli in a pan, it's a different smell compared to cooking it. Cooking is almost no smell, but baking it releases the smell. And then you put it, it's kind of hot still, you put it in the Tupperware and then you open it when you're in school. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to smell. And uh, people were complaining always, but I was like, oh, this is for a goal. And now they see what it has ultimately brought to me. So uh, you should always 
never pay attention to others when you have a goal in mind. Because usually when they see you with your meals, they wish they could have done it. They wish they had the discipline to do it their, themselves. So I used to work also in a greenhouse. And you, every time there was a break, you have like a big table and like 20 people come together to have a break, eat, lunch, and then go back to work. Everybody in the Netherlands always has sandwiches with cheese or sandwiches with even like chocolate paste or uh, I don't know, just not always the healthiest choices. And that's normal. No one complains about that. But when I open my Tupperware container with like, like they call it, why are you eating dinner now? Or why are you eating dinner foods like rice or potatoes or fish or something? I'm like, yeah, they, you're, you're saying that not because you don't like it, but you wish you would have the discipline to eat healthy like this. Because if you tell a person, okay, tomorrow you're going to wake up with 10 kilos of extra muscle and, your, and abs, is anybody going to say no? Of course, everybody's going to say yes. But to the work, they're going to say no. And that's what they're jealous of, that you are doing the work for it. And they are not because they are going with the simple stuff. So you, yeah, that's what I always think about when uh, somebody's complaining about uh, preparing, <coughs> eating prepared food like that. But yeah, personally, I like to make uh, things fresh. Anyone else with something? Questions? What's your goals beyond bodybuilding? So uh, we also have a, our own gym back in the Netherlands. And uh, people often ask me, yeah, bodybuilding isn't a sport forever. So once you retire from the professional sport of going on stage, what are you going to do afterwards? So I have two big options. I am I am a registered diet, sports dietitian. So it's a protected title, which I can still use and practice like dietetics if I want to. I don't, but you know. <laughs> still something I, I always thought I need to have something as a backup as an official university grade, that I can always say, at least I have this, like what if I break a leg or something, and then I always have something as a backup. But that is the backup, and the main thing is gonna be the gym, because we already, um, this year, after the Arnold, it already transformed, we put in 40 new machines. Uh, so it's a huge transformation of the gym. And uh, yeah, actually a new batch is gonna come in like two weeks again. So we put a new floor on the gym to put more machines on there as well. So it's, it turned from a more of a CrossFit gym to now a hardcore bodybuilding gym over the course of seven years. And uh, we also have a 24 seven system. So we have to be there less and less and get more and more people there. So it's kind of self sustainable so that we can still do our thing at home while the gym is running on its own basically so we can be more of a managing role in that so that is going to be a big part but i also really love i love nutrition and also giving seminars like this even more like more detail based like really with a presentation or talking about a specific subject that's what i love as well so i might delve into that more too because i do a lot of research about that nutrition and supplements and I just love. I just find it very interesting. Whenever something new comes out, I pretty much know about it really quickly, and it's just a big interest of me. So, yeah, whenever stuff like this is able to happen in the future, that's when I uh, will take it. But for now, the full focus is still on the on the Olympia, and really depending on how the Olympia goes and how bodybuilding goes, maybe you don't even have to do think about the money aspect anymore in the future, but more about how do I feel in my life meaningful. And when you have children, that's kind of easy to do. Anything else? Okay, so I think we're gonna go through the pictures with Wesley and uh, Stefan. If anybody likes, carry on. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go.